Hello. Thank you very much. This is uh, the third video of the cycle IDS Mudra about the ground, the path, and the fruit. Um, so I have been a little bit uh, given some kind of a, a map that we uh, we can uh, ground our body, ground our speech, and ground our mind, which is just a way of talking about a kind of uh, exploration of our own qualities and how we could make our qualities manifest and also let go of whatever doesn't allow us to manifest the qualities. So, of course, when you talk about manifesting qualities, it's um, nowadays we have to be careful now. It doesn't mean that you need to manifest them uh, in social media or in the street. It's just that if you do manifest them to yourselves and if you live like that, if you live with uh, this uh, connection, this friendship towards yourself, which is also a connection to your inner qualities of wisdom and of compassion, which are naturally um, present in the human, in the human precious body, which we are also talking about since last session. It will slowly become obvious that some things are going to change about how you react. It's going to become obvious that you'd feel less entangled with uh, emotions that are nervous or uh, too much reactive because sometimes we react very quickly and it's probably not based on what's really happening. And then, of course, the reaction can make something happened that was exactly what we didn't want to happen, but our reaction provoked that. That's how usually wars are happening. It's very important nowadays, I think, that all of us do our best to help each other, to put more energy in the sense of human beings, not auto-destructive, not destroying ourselves and destroying our environment. I don't think it's too much uh, the idea of fighting people <laughs> because that's also going to lead to war which will destroy much faster everything. Uh, it is more understanding the roots of uh, um, duality as an illusion because as we talked about already and we will find that very easily when we train the body it's very easy to find. This illusion of duality is actually the basics for the material life, how we live in our body nowadays on Earth. I mean, this body, I don't know about other planets or other um, universes, but in this case, our body is um, uh, based on some kind of duality, like breathing in, breathing out, and all these things I already a little bit commented. Um, but it gives an illusion that we could be, uh, for one thing, I'm like, I would say I belong to the inspiration uh, people and I don't like the inspiration people to make it very caricatural. Usually it's more subtle, but it can be not subtle at all also, which doesn't make any sense because actually you do inspire and expire and that produces a flow that is what we call the respire. And if you look at the word, rur is like in to do again, to, uh, to come back again. And spire is spiral. So the spiral of your breath exists because you breathe in and breathe out. So this is an example. But as the same way it happens between us and people, we react very quickly or we have some kind of a certainty that something is happening but actually it's not really happening the way we think it is because we only are one-sided on the situation and then our reaction is very often rooted in some kind of memories or some kind of family habits or just some kind of uh, very um, strong uh, identification with fear. And so we make happen something that was not going to happen. I could give an example that's a little bit uh, obvious, like some uh, a couple, one would be jealous of the other and being so much jealous, so much jealous and so much accusing that the other ends up doing that thing. 
<laughs> so we're not going to enter this now because this is more about emotion, but it's important to understand that the more uh, you understand the ground, the grounding, the easiest it is to do the path because the path is actually when you're starting really to experience properly and thoroughly and genuinely the grounding. <laughs> That's how it starts. Uh, and actually, there's not much more to it at the end because the, the natural the natural qualities, they come up as you ground and you ground more. So the grounding is like almost everything. Um, so we said that, uh, of course, we're going to work on the body. I will do some uh, videos with uh, Carolina, Carolina Fonseca, the dancer. She will come uh, to be with me a few days and I will uh, uh, ask for her help to make a few movies about some kind of exercises we could do physically. And, um, and also the breath, of course, obviously. And now I'm more talking about the grounding of the map, how you have a vision of your journey, even if you don't really uh, know everything, because as I said last time, when you drive, you don't know what's after the curve of the road, but you have a little bit an idea of where you're going and a little bit an idea of how your car uh, can get there, things like that, you know? So, uh, and also to very strongly um, attain a point that you understand that it makes a lot of sense, this adventure you have uh, invited into your life, because it's like the adventure for me, uh, it's the adventure of the reason why uh, I was born. Uh, there's nothing else more important than the path and the relationship with the essential qualities of um, the fact that I came to life. I mean, if we can take it simply like that, it's much easier because sometimes lots, lots of theories and lots of beliefs and concepts don't help that much. Mm. Okay, so now um, in this case, there's a, a advices. So if we're talking about grounding your mind to have a proper, uh, it's like a proper posture of your body. There's the proper posture of your mind so that your mind can really take control a little bit of your behavior. As I said, as a friend, be in friend to yourself. But the guidance in Dharma is to understand that uh, as far as we are uh, um, under the power of strong habits, habitual tendencies and strong uh, I would say concept, you know, uh, in rooted in duality and in that thing I I said I said before, no, like I am this side, you are this side, and we don't understand that actually this duality does produce if we have a good uh, um, perception, produces the possibility for wisdom instead of reacting as from one side or the other. Um, it's you know like you don't have your right eye doesn't argue with your left eye, but if you close one of the eyes, you will not see the same thing at the same place. You will see that thing is at one place, and when you do like that, it seems to be in another place. But they do work together, and you really can reach that thing you're looking at. So, um, in order to, to understand how could we not make our case worse, that's a little bit the idea. Because when we talk of a progressive path, and I invite you to see the previous videos, because otherwise it's difficult. I, know, I cannot repeat everything we have been studying so far. But when we're talking about this progressive path, of course, we have to understand that the enlightenment, the awakening is immediate. It happens immediately. And it can happen also a little bit. You know, you can have little awakening, little satoris on your meditation or in your daily life or in even in the midst of something that you were not expecting at all, it can happen like that, it's immediate. But the progressive path is that on the, along the journey, we need to have tools to work with our habitual tendencies. Why? <laughs> because we have a tendency to make things worse. I think we can see this is obvious and maybe I could propose that we see that the whole world situation is not uh, the guilt of anybody, it's just our human, human and all of 
the beings on earth, but human nowadays are very responsible for the situation. And specifically, uh, from the point of view of how human understand the situation, of course, if you have a spider home, the spider doesn't really have the same kind of outset about what's happening in the world than you do. But it is obvious that there are less insects, for example, than before and uh, things like that. So this is the human being uh, a little bit um, making, obviously, uh, his uh, ownership on everything a problem. Mm -hmm. So um, if we understand that, we understand that we can have some kind of a, a slowly um, um, I would call that some software, you know, because we have internet now. So software is that you have something that helps you to do something in a proper way easier. So it's a little bit like that. And everything we invented in internet and, and uh, artificial intelligence, it, it is extension of what we already have. We already have internet in our own mind. It, it's already there. It's just that we are so much interested in everything that is uh, out that we did not really realize that we have this inner ability so this is why sometimes uh, if you really invite your intuition it's important as i said last time to to read a poetry or to look at something that gives you insight so that you can connect to your inner qualities um, but if we take it a little bit more like um, the um, uh, how you build the structure for this intuitive intuition and practice to happen happily you need not to accumulate more bad energy because the more bad energy sticks to you as a being the more this bad energy is there and i'm talking about our own uh, production of bad energy you know because if you understand the Dharma, you understand suddenly that others are not really the problem, you know, because you can work with others thanks to your own qualities, but you first have to link these qualities because otherwise, how can you work with the negativity of others? You don't have to fear too much others. Maybe, of course, if you're a strong smoker and you stop smoking, maybe don't go too much in places where everybody smokes, of course, makes more sense, no? Things like that. I don't have to say these things because it's very obvious. <clears throat> now I'm going to talk a little bit about the idea of the foundation of how we create a mindset uh, regarding the Tibetan Buddhism. And the Tibetan Buddhism, as I said, is really um, the condensation and also elaboration inside this condensation of all the techniques they could uh, gather together uh, of the Buddhism, together with tools that come from lots of traditions. Of course, when I say the tools come from lots of tradition, it's very simply. It's because we're human beings and we share things. And, you know, I live with a person who's a Sufi and I'm a Buddhist and we share things. It doesn't make any difference. It doesn't matter because we don't care about labels. You understand? <clears throat> but... Um, in the case of Buddhism, as I said, and I will insist, what makes the difference of Buddhism with a lot of other path, it's not most of the things, the spiritual path are very much alike, but it is maybe I would say two things. One is the technology is really, really, very uh, contemporary. It's like the Buddha was always contemporary since the beginning because he went to the direct things that happens to human beings no matter what is the culture no matter what is the the time and it's not about revelation or about believing in things <clears throat> so the techniques are very important and very sophisticated and very effective and very different kinds of ways of working with different techniques but the other thing is there's not any belief in some kind of a entity that would create things, like we would call it God or goddess or gods or goddesses. In Buddhism, gods and goddesses are beings just like us with other kind of qualities, but they are not the creators of the world, okay? Because uh, when you reach a state of uh, awakening, even when you have small awakening, you start to understand that um, it's not the truth 
to project some kind of consistent explanation of this state. It is a very deep state that is not, like says the Buddha, it's, it's a place where you don't have the eyes and the seeing things, or you don't have the ears and listening to things, you don't have the thoughts and thinking about things. So it's impossible to describe. So it's, it's very difficult to project that as being somebody who created things or, or start to project on that experience an explanation that does some kind of, um, it, it can destroy the experience because the experience is very much free from this entanglement in relationship with what we see, what we think, what we hear, what we feel. Of course, it's not that you disrespect uh, the life, because everything in Buddhism is always about, in the same time, respecting relative truth, which is what you see, what you hear, what you feel, what you smell, what you think, but also the absolute, which is absolutely free from all of these. So this is always working with this paradox. I really have to insist on that. And so when you relax in this paradox, and you can find a kind of a silence, which is the the silence is where the music happens. The silence is where the voice can reach uh, far, you see? Because thanks to the silence, there is the possibility to hear. So this is why the form is a void. The void is the form, and the form is not either than the void. The void is not either than the form. So this is how we work as a Buddhist, straightforward into the rea reality here and now and not too much going into beliefs, into different why, why is it, why, why do I exist, why does this, why does that, because this is considered as distractions. Distractions are the main obstacle. obstacle. So here, this book, I want to recommend you this book. I can recommend you things slowly, um, I will, um, start to be a little bit more organized. Now I'm just experiencing this uh, video things, but slowly I will make it more organized. But now already you can see it's the words of my perfect teacher, of Pacho Rinpoche. Uh, this is Padmakara translation book group. You have this book in many languages. So it's translated in many languages. It's a big book, but it's very easy to read. And I want to recommend you this book in the same time uh, be careful because in the, in the progressive path we explain the world a certain way in the beginning and as you get closer to the great perfection, Dzogchen or Mahamudra, which is another way of saying that, the closer you get to that vision, um, the, the more different, um, how could I say, the, the closer you get to that vision, the more things are, show, are seen in a different way. You understand? It's like in the beginning, you see a lot. How can you work with the faults and with the difficult things? And how can you avoid being negative? How can you avoid creating suffering so much for yourself and for others? But slowly, you get to a point where you're more relating to the nature of your own mind and less relating to the problems of the samsara. So when you read the book, you have to have this in mind because you could say, oh, <clears throat> I don't like this, I don't like that. But maybe you take up the book, whatever you really need to be less negative, because that's what the book is for. And then you get to a point where in the book, you're going to progressively see the world as if you were seeing a poetry or a, a art, um, a big art, something uh, absolutely beautiful and absolutely not... Um, that solid as it used to be, much less solid, okay? So this is important to understand. So here, um, Patrul Impoche, who was a great, great master, and he was a great master that uh, he used to hang around in the mountains and everywhere and practice all the time. And people would tell him, ah, this master Pacho Rinpoche is so wonderful. And he would say, ah, yes, where is he? I would like to see him. And actually he was Pacho Rinpoche. <laughs> so he was uh, very humble and very, um, uh, how you say, um, low profile, uh, absolutely low profile. 
and he is very famous because he was a great teacher himself and that he did really uh, create some kind of uh, manuals, books that were useful for simple people that were not always very sophisticated. So this book is very easy to read, actually. So he says that uh, in the first thing is that when you listen to, when we listen to teachings, it's very important that we have the right attitude. So here the attitude is about how, <coughs> how is the posture of listening? So the, the, I like this, they call it the three defects of the pot. So it means that if you have a pot, if it's upside down, you cannot put anything in there. So that's not the right uh, attitude. It's like if uh, you're not present to what's uh, being said. And there's also the other example is the pot with a hole. It's like you have a pot, but things cannot go in there because there's a hole in there. So you listen, but you don't, you don't really remember any of it. And then there's the pot that contains poison. So it's in this case, it's very important to understand that poison is that you mix whatever you're listening to with something else that does not make your absorption of the teaching appropriate. So it does, even if what you're thinking about is not directly very bad, let's say, it's, it's completely damaging your understanding of the Dharma because the Dharma is really something you need to listen thoroughly, completely present, completely empty, but in the same time absorbing. And then it's because you experience that, that you confirm that it is true, you know? So it's very important this attitude is to thoroughly, completely absorb it, absorb it and then not making too much assumptions about things, but experiencing the thing. Like for example, if you're practicing the mind training, which is a whole set of training about exchanging your goodness and happiness with the suffering of other people, when you practice these, these practices, you could think, um, Ah, oh, it's very complicated, no? To somebody comes, and one of the things you can practice is that somebody comes and accuses you of things and just insults you and say you are this and you are that. And I can tell you that because I did experience this a few times. So, what you do if you practice the mind training is, is that you just say okay and you let the person treat you bad, uh, um, verbally, of course. Huh? In this case because you're accepting the guilt. Because if you take the guilt, as the guilt goes, the situation can be more pacified, like in wars now. If you take the guilt, even if the person accuses you and you say, yes, it's right, yes, of course, maybe I'm a horrible person, I have to understand how, how I can be a better person because you're right, I'm, I did this very wrong, of course. And even if it's not true, the person relaxes and because the person relaxes the relationship changes and it is very very impressive so i can talk about the mind training not because i read the book but because i have the experience of it, of trying what is explained really and trying it when i'm ready because sometimes i for in my case i didn't feel ready to do that for a few years actually and because it's very uh, intense, because the idea of the mind train is that you really take the suffering of all beings on yourself. But it's not because you are some kind of unhappy, it's because you produce so much goodness, you, you are so much linked to what is light and good and, and deep and wise and compassionate, full of love, that it doesn't end. It's like never ending source of goodness. It's, this is what is immortality, the real immortality is that we have this uh, relationship with this uh, source of energy in, in within, ourselves, within ourselves. And so when you do this practice, as you trust this uh, non-ending energy source of goodness and source of lightness and of compassion and of love and completely universal, but in the same time rooted within yourself, you can do it, you can, you can suddenly do that thing that's so weird is to accept the suffering and give your goodness. 
And then suddenly you start to understand that the more you do that, the more you feel your goodness is growing. So it is based on experience. So here, if your pot is not upside down, if there's no hole in there, and if it does uh, not mix whatever you're listening to with your own concepts or your own assumptions, or even poison sometimes, then um, you can properly practice. And you can practice on your own pace. Of course, you can have master, or you can have several masters, and you can be helped by people that's really completely what the Sangha is about when you take refuge in Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. The Sangha is the help. And you can have lots of degrees of help. You can go completely in a love story that is incredible, that you really love your guru so much that you become completely devoted, which is beautiful and which is a gift. But if that's not your gift, if you don't have this gift, you can also just relate with a few people that help you. It's okay. It's not uh, Vajrayana, but it is okay for Mahayana and for uh, Theravada. You can do that. Um, even listening to me is like an act of the Sangha. Yes. Also, I would like to thank people who did uh, send me private messages to tell me that it was helpful. So because they find it's helpful, that's why I'm trying to do a little bit quicker my videos and not just one <laughs> every three months <laughs> okay and so <clears throat> this is the way to listen so it's very important and it's in this book which i told you the words of my perfect teacher and here you have everything explained so it's really very very nice to have this book of course i'm not going to go through all of it because the best thing is to read uh, your, the book yourself but there's a, a nice little poem here Listen to the teachings like a deer listening to music. Contemplate them like a northern nomad sharing a sheep. Meditate on them like a dumb person souring food. Practice them like a hungry yak eating grass. And reach their result like the sun coming out from behind the clouds. I feel a lot of uh, gratefulness and it makes me a little bit cry always of um, how much I am very touched by the generosity of all these people during centuries giving us all of this poetry and, and advices and wonderful and philosophic and also practical practices. Okay, so say, uh, having said that, you uh, get into the precious human body. So here, the precious human body, just let me find. Just let me find the, yeah. The idea of the precious human, it's the whole chapter is about the precious human body. So, um, you understand that you have freedoms. So here it's explained what they mean by freedom. And what is precious in your human body is that you are able to practice. If you're not able to practice, it's not a precious human body, it's just a human condition. The human condition is, is a condition with a lot of sensibility to pain and a lot of sensibility also to love. So we have these two that can help us because we understand pain and suffering, we can arise our wisdom to be lovable and to also be full of love. Mm -hmm. So here they explain to you how you are free and how you're not free. So this is very technical because um, in Buddhism, in Tibetan Buddhism, if you really study, it's very interesting because they, they forget nothing. <laughs> There's not a single little something that is forgotten, forgotten. So you cannot not know something. It's just that it's very difficult for Occidental people, Westerners. They want to know everything and that became a distraction. So actually very often their study of the Dharma is, became a distraction because it's not helping them experience. So of course, it's like I said last time, you have to choose 
in your supermarket, what are you going to buy? You're not going to buy everything. So here it's not a supermarket because it's not for sale, it's for free, but it is very valuable, it's a treasure. So you have to choose, like he would say, ah, the mind training, taking the guilt, I'm not able now, but I will, I will get there. And if you're very steady, you will get there suddenly. You, this will happen to me. Suddenly you're ready. Suddenly you're doing it, you know? But first you know it's not the moment because you get in friendship with yourself. So the whole thing is very much relying on you, on you, yourself, <laughs> with yourself. And how much you can understand that your way of understanding the world and responding to the world and relating to the world is, is really your own projection. So if you are clearing the, all these projections, like, like your glasses and the veils, they are going away. You're getting closer and closer to the true perception of the world just as it is. And it is very directly simple. It's raw, you know? It's like when you listen to a sound, I don't know, I, I don't have here my instruments there, but if you listen to a sound, I'm sorry. If you listen to a sound like this one, for example. You just let the sound be. And you just let yourself be. So that there is not so much I and the sound. There is more like the sound, the silence, and my perceptions just become one experience. It seems um, obvious, but it's not happening. And it's the same thing when we're relating to people. Let the people be, and let yourself be, and just find at one moment where underneath there is an energy there that has a lot of possibilities instead of creating all the time a projection. Like, it's very easy to understand. Like, if somebody tells you that this person said this about you, you will not be able, very often, most of us, to see this person again the same way you used to see this person because the other poisoned your mind about that person. So maybe that other person did say something bad about you, maybe not, you understand? But anyway, <laughs> if you relate to that person, from the precious path of relationship, this person will maybe drop bad things this person is saying about you. Maybe this person is not able to not say bad things about everybody, <laughs> you know? It, it's, just, um, it's just like that. And it's the same for yourself. If you say bad things about people, maybe you understand that you don't want to, but you can't help yourself, <laughs> you know? But when you meet somebody who is able to accept you just the way you are and to relax, you relax and then you stop doing that. You see, this is how war stops. War is all about these things. And it's, of course, about food and about generosity. But of course, this is obviously the generosity, the key, of course. But anyway, we're going to keep on doing this first, okay? So... So your body becomes really a precious body when it is free of everything that doesn't let you be a practitioner in the sense of relating to yourself in the way of raising your wisdom, raising your peace, raising your qualities, mm -hmm. and accepting yourself just as you are in the same time, of course. Yes, I think I'm expressing right. And so, um, yeah, and then there's some advices that, for example, if you want to keep this good condition you have, if you have this good condition of freedom that you're able to practice, you need to um, perform in a virtuous way. Because if you don't uh, sort out, neg um, if you don't sort out positive energy, your conditions are not going to be good. Uh, the condition is a little bit like your ground for planting. If your, if your ground is not properly ready with what is needed, water and nutrients and whatever is needed for that tree or for that plant, that tree or that plant cannot grow. So 
here in Buddhism, what we really look forward to is to be free from all kinds of clouds, the dark clouds, which is negative, or the white clouds, which are positive. But we need more white clouds than dark clouds to see, to have light, to be able to practice properly. And then the, the clouds just can at one point vanish in the mind. And it's about the mind. So the positive energy. So it, you need to, to understand how is it that I produce suffering and uh, how is it that I can produce merit. Merit is that you are uh, giving yourself a good condition of life that is proper to practice. It means that you just have what you need. You don't have to have more than what you need, but you learn how to have satisfaction and to be yourself some kind of a good a good person to be with or a good person to has good influence on people so let me explain huh? it doesn't mean that you're all nice all the time because this sometimes is wrong you know i met very 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 genuine great people and great masters that are not nice okay so it's not about how you pretend to be yeah that you pretend to be all yes all the time. It's not that. It's more the genuinely goodness of yourself. And in the same time, as you're not rejecting your character, or I mean, if, if you are, um, you know, uh, it's like flowers, you know, some flowers are, are very soft and some are a little bit picky, you know, or like the roses. Yeah? And the rose has this, you can hurt yourself on, when you touch the rose, you know. So if you are like that, if you're like a rose, you have this beautiful rose, and in the same time, if somebody touches, he can hurt. It's just okay. It's not that you are doing something wrong. It's different. You understand? Doing something wrong is having this idea all the time that the world around me is something out of me, and I have to defend myself, and I have to grasp something out of it. So this is where, and also I don't understand anything about it. I'm always projecting on it. So this is where the, the black clouds come from. You know, it's not that you need to behave that you look all sweetie honey, yes? If you are sweetie honey, that's very good, but there are some people that are not sweetie honey. They are sore and, and hot and it's okay too. Because that's how it is, no? It's the diversity of beings. It's no problem. Uh, I want to really say that because nowadays, uh, a lot of techniques for uh, being successful, supposedly, in life is to be all sweetie and all honey. But it is a very big problem when that becomes a way of, uh, of fooling people and fooling oneself, yeah? You have to be very careful about that, yes? It's very, it's like you're going to start to like uh, everything. Just imagine you want to grasp something out of somebody. So you're going to like it all the time that somebody, so that that somebody uh, sees you. So this is very simple thing that we do on internet, but it's a way of not being genuine. Yeah. It's a way of uh, trying to grasp something out of uh, somebody. But if you really re uh, establish a, a real heart relationship with the world and with people, at one point it's not about fear and it's not about hope. Yeah, It's really about the direct raw connection, the true connection. And even maybe you can listen to the truth of that person if that truth is not nice for you. Or maybe you can also as sometimes even say the truth Maybe not all the time, but sometimes, yeah. So the second uh, meditation about your precious human body is uh, it's not forever. So this is very important because this is really important because uh, I always thought this was very obvious, you know, but I think we are afraid of seeing things as they are. Um, it is not forever because you were a baby and now you're not a baby. So it changes and everything changes. So there is not a single thing that you possess that you will possess forever. Not even your human body, not even health, not even wealth, not even relationships. People die. 
um, things um, like you can have an electric piano and then at one point uh, some of the touches don't work anymore there's no more sound or you have a washing machine i have a problem with the washing machine it doesn't work suddenly so yes it's obvious uh, but we forget about it because we are suddenly in some kind of a drama uh, unbelievable drama because something happens to us and it seems that like like if we were not aware that that is really the way it is. Of course, I'm sad if I love somebody or an animal or something and that person is gone, somehow gone forever in a certain point of view, not gone forever in my heart, in my dreams, or maybe in some kind of a, a, a different dimension, but gone forever on my daily life. And of course, I'm sad, that's okay. But the very dramatic reaction is because we didn't realize that it is the way it is. Everything we have, everything we are, everything can just go now. And that's the proper way of understanding wisdom. Because if you don't understand that, there's no wisdom. Because there is always the real root of suffering that the Buddha taught, which is craving grasping so this teaching is very important so we're talking about the ground but actually this ground is really really the real <laughs> it's the real dharma is that we understand deeply that each moment is the first and it is the last exactly like a samurai it's a, the same when you're an artist and you're going on the stage at the moment you enter the stage you have this feeling usually uh, that's why lots of people, before they go on stage, they're so shaking uh, fear, no? You have this feeling like a samurai, like this is the first and the last moment. And believe me, these warriors, were, when they did this warrior path, which is very bloody, <laughs> they did live that also because they had this uh, experience that through the, the dwell with other warriors, they could wake up to the reality of course i'm not recommending that path but uh, because it's not really the best to be killing people to awake yourself <laughs> but it, this path did exist uh, as a way of uh, uh, reaching non-violence actually that's how aikido, aikido was born the the warrior uh, yushiba did create aikido because he did reach the state by the war and by the warrior path he reached the state of nonviolence that is the true deep state of nonviolence and actually he describes that he was in the middle of a battlefield and the bullets were coming and he started to see everything in a different way and so he was not touched by the bullets because he the time became slower that's my way of explaining it huh? uh, maybe that's not right but that's my way of explaining it. it's like if the time as the time is not the same pace he could really be completely aware of the bullets and not be killed. And that's when he understand that the nonviolence was so important because he reached the state of nonviolence within himself, which is no fear, which is the full acceptance of death, the full acceptance of impermanence. And so you can reach satisfaction. It's a little bit like if you have a fast and don't eat for a few days, and then when you eat something, slowly you get the full taste of things. So this is very important. So the impermanence is very important. And to meditate on that, so it means you look at it, please don't make a drama out of it. <laughs> yeah. You, you listen to music and then the music is finished and you still have the echo of that music. And then slowly, 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 the echo just dissolves into silence. And uh, you met somebody and then that somebody is gone now and you go your home and maybe you will never see that somebody again. So that's why it's so important that we can understand that our people are in our lives, even if you're married or your husband or your wife, whatever, maybe you never see them again. So be very... Um, um, 
aware of the value of what is your goodbye every day, what is your hello every day. Because sometimes we live with somebody and we think it's just like it's part of the, no, <laughs> of the furniture. <laughs> no? It's not like that. The truth is that everything does go at one point. And then you can also be, as I said, smart. Like you lost your jewelry, you love that jewel, and that jewel was your grandmother's, and you love it so much, and it's so wonderful, and it's so important, and it's so, it's so much my family and my, okay, okay, you lost it. So instead of being completely disvasted by that, you can give the jewel. You know, actually in French, Georges Brassens has a, Georges Brassens is a singer and a poet, French, uh, he was, he died. But he wrote very beautiful songs. And one of the songs is a song he wrote to the person who entered his house and stole all of his things, but did not steal his guitar. And so he, he wrote to, for him a song saying, thank you that you didn't take my guitar, because this is really incredible that you let me my guitar. So um, he said, so in this case, I give you everything you took, I give it to you. And this is a very good attitude, because if you lost it, you give it. And the, so you can make merit, because somebody uh, stole you, instead of being angry at that person and becoming uh, yeah, like that. Some people are uh, in cultures, like here in Portugal, a lot of people are like that. They, they are Christian, but actually they do really uh, crave into uh, being pissed off, <laughs> you know? They don't show it so much, but they, are, they do have that a lot in the culture, you know? Like if uh, somebody stole something from you, you're pissed off forever. But it's more interesting if you think that you give that thing and that you don't stay pissed off forever because it's your pr proper energy, it's yourself. You are the one who has to live in the pissed off one <laughs> because you are your own company. So if you're not pissed off forever, it's much better and you can feel the richness of satisfaction with little things much more and you can be much more creative with the world and much more flexible so this is very important impermanence is one of the most important so you have a precious human being don't lose your time too much okay because as say Dzongsak and Tsinipoche we have eight hours of sleep or seven and then we have four hours of eating and uh, doing things and then we have maybe two hours of looking at the tv and maybe we have so many hours of working and at the end what's left for your practice of course slowly you get your practice into the work you get your practice into whatever you do but in the beginning you're not able to so in the beginning you'll need at least to value your precious human body, to value the fact that you can lose everything at one moment. Don't be afraid, the opposite. Use that richness you have now so that you can produce more good. You can produce more energy, more merit. And nobody can take it from you because that is not a tangible something. You cannot be robbed of your merit, okay? The only thing that can happen is that you get suddenly negative and then you let your merit go. It, you just le lose it because you got very angry or you got very negative. Yeah? So this is very good because even if you die, you die in this marriage. So if you die in the marriage, you have a very good um, uh, condition for rebirth instead of have a bad condition for rebirth. So this is really important. And so then we study exactly what I'm talking about, which is the karma. It's what is cause and effect. So sometimes, you know, like says the Dalai Lama, if I can do something for, to solve a, uh, a problem, why should I worry? And if I can do nothing, what's the means of worrying? Because I cannot do anything anyway, <laughs> you know? So this logical, this rational logic is very useful because it's a little bit like childish but it's very useful so um what's the point of this and what's the point of that so fear what's the point of fear of course we are afraid i am afraid you know i don't have as much fear as i used to have but maybe when i was a child i had less fear maybe i was less fearful than as an adult 
And now as an elder lady, I have a little bit less fear than I had when I was in the middle age. Because slowly, what's, what, 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 it doesn't help, <laughs> you know, it doesn't help. Of course, uh, you have this instinct, no, that the fire burns, so you take your hand away. But that's not exactly the fear I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fear, for example, of death. Somehow, death looks like birth, because actually when you got out of your mother's womb, you died from that condition. And actually, most of us don't remember. And then you were born in another condition, which is not in water and not with the food coming from your belly button, but from the navel, no? You know, the food comes from the navel when you're a baby. And then you get out and then you have to breathe suddenly. And it's very painful because the oxygen, actually oxygen it hurts. Yeah, the oxygen is at the origin of uh, material uh, existence on earth, the oxygen was a poison. So now we got used to it, but it's some kind of a, it burns. So when you're born, you're born into air and you're not anymore related to that other body that feeds you. So it's like if you were di dying, but you did born again. And so when you're going to die, it's the same thing. It doesn't change. You just go from one condition to the other because the consciousness never stops. It's not exactly like saying I'm eternal, it's different. Because it's not me, it's a changing process of experiences with an awareness that is aware or not in that process, yes? So the more you understand that death is actually an opportunity for awareness, the less you fear it because you start to understand that it, this is a, your best, it's like your one shot opportunity. Maybe you have one later after death, no? But at that moment, it's very important. So everything about fear is like that. I'm not saying we don't have some very deep fears that we cannot help. Of course we do. Yeah, of course I do. Yeah. But you do use this childish logical thing to overcome that without... As I said, we are a friend to ourselves, so you're not forcing yourself, but you can slowly start to relate with what makes you afraid, just like the psychologists do. You, you be your own psychologist, yeah? So, or even also, I could say, also things you don't like, you know, like I don't like beans, or I don't like this, or I don't like that. You can also slowly understand that maybe you uh, end up liking it, or I don't like Wagner music, and then, when I was younger, I didn't know Wagner and I didn't like it too much. And my, at that time, husband put me in the dark, shut off all the lights and put me Wagner. So I just listened in the dark to Wagner. And I discovered that Wagner was incredible. And something I didn't like became something I was really liking very much. And I listened a lot for many, many hours uh, to Wagner's music because it's very, um, it's a very, very, uh, powerful uh, feeling of sound. It really uh, drives your imagination, no? So the karma is also look into what happens, like if somebody tells me something what happens in my mind and how does that change my reaction? So when I do the same, how does it do on others' mind? When I do something, there is a consequence. And when other people do something, there's a consequence. But everything that I am made of and everything that people are made of and things are made of are all in this frame of causes and consequences from the point of view of the materialistic uh, set of things, bodies, you know, the five elements, of course, if you go into the quantic energy, you find that things are not exactly like that. They have another, but when you go in the quantic energy, you're going into this awareness. You're get, getting in, uh, into the camps of consciousness. So it is a different way of understanding the world. And nowadays it's very important we understand this because on one point the karma is important because if I do shut the door on my finger, I will have a hurt on my finger, maybe I cut my finger. Uh, 
So it's just true. Even if the door is not that solid and my finger is not that solid in the minimal study of material, yes? So we need to understand that the world is really solid within the solid awareness of people, like animals, uh, fear, uh, craving, all this uh, set up of craving for food, craving for love, craving for sex, craving for this, or fearful of this, fearful of that, all of this hope and fear thing, it does uh, obey to rules. Like if you hurt somebody, that somebody will experience something that creates an energy. It's like that. So this is very important because the karma is how the causes and conditions gives you the place, the time for awareness. When you have the awareness, then you can go deeper into above appearances to go inside the material set up and understand that appearances are appearances but actually it's not that much exactly as i thought it was you understand and then you need as a buddhist to be in both worlds this is what we we looking for as for as an artist it is working on space and time it's very important like for example if you work on looking at objects, look at the space around the object and don't look at the object itself. Maybe you put the object somewhere and you see all the space and that will allow you to see the object properly and people. When I said uh, time, it's because also in art you can work with time, you get into that time, specifically the performing art, but maybe also of course, called uh, visual art too, of course. So the time is also that your awareness gets into time and you start to penetrate the sense of time. And you penetrate into the time that's not anymore like a line, but it becomes like a deepness, yes? That's very important. So that's the importance of trance. Uh, you could say even trance lucid, huh? like you're lucid, you're not, you didn't lose control completely of the material uh, set up, I'm sitting here, but somehow you go in trance, so you go completely, completely in another perception of things. So um, this is important because it allows us to understand that even though uh, I did forget my finger in the door and it hurts, maybe something beyond was made, making me distracted. And maybe that thing that made me distracted is something that can awake me. So that pain and that thing that happened to my finger can become a way of understanding deeply my presence and my consciousness. It's not, oh, I was so stupid, I let my finger, I was distracted. It's not like that. I told you, be your friend, I'm insisting. Huh? If you want this to be useful, your critical mind should be useful. Should, your critical mind should not be something that hurts people, that makes bad. You should not use your critical thinking to uh, sort out all the effects of everybody online. Uh, it's not good energy for anybody. It's not, and it's not uh, useful. You need to use your critical mind to understand your own perceptions and to make as much as possible your own uh, influence on people on the world useful. That it's, does it make any sense to say this or not? Sometimes, you know, even there's a great, uh, I think it's Shanti Deva said, if you are full of emotion, just stick there and don't move like if you were a piece of wood. It makes a lot of sense. Because at one moment you just pff, drop like a piece of wood. Because you're not seen and understanding anything properly so it's not the moment to do things <laughs> you know so this is your critical mind you see yourself in your critical mind it's because i have a friend who's writing things about critical mind so i'm um, making some dissertation about that your critical mind is about yourself first it's not about others <laughs> but of course if you want to help for example that there's less war or less uh, fighting or less uh, pain. 
you genuinely find the way to be influence, an influence to wake up people, not to their anger that much, but more to their inner wisdom. Because sometimes, of course, sometimes we have to do something. Maybe sometimes I have to tell the child, don't do that. Of course, it happens. But it doesn't come from my hatred towards the child. When I say the child, no, I'm not hating the child. So it's very important, these things. And we are human, so we need, we need to get up to our uh, potential. We are, have a huge potential. And now we have huge uh, weapons, weapons, and we have everything we created that's so powerful. So we need to get up to that level. I mean, if our awareness is not at the level of our tools, our tools will destroy everything. It's just like that. We cannot avoid that. Yeah. So we have to get to the level. If we have artificial intelligence, this artificial intelligence is going to force us to be more intelligent. And intelligent, what is intelligent? What does that mean? What does success mean? What does wealth mean? Is it money? Is it uh, to be the best of the world? Is it that or is it something much, much more, I would say, juicy? Yeah. Is success about reaching the deep awareness of your own being? Nobody needs to know, or maybe everybody knows. It doesn't matter. That's wealth. That's, that's richness. That's success. Yes? So I'm insistent on, on this, and this is what gives me um, motivation to do these videos, is that I think um, nowadays people are very, um, how you say, under the power of energies, of the five elements that are disturbed. Five elements are strong wind, strong uh, heat, strong cold, strong water, strong. And then we want to create systems and concepts to fight things, but it doesn't work because it comes from our beings. It doesn't come from our <laughs> manipulation. The more we want to control everything, the worse it gets. Because the thing you need to control is your own emotions, not other people. <laughs> so at one point, uh, I think this is enough for today. I didn't get into the whole thing about karma and samsara, which is the last part of the study about grounding your mind for your journey, to go on the journey, to start to do the practice. But we will next time. So now um, I did recommend you this book, The Words of My Perfect Teacher. I will put it in the commentaries on YouTube. And also uh, check sometimes the videos on YouTube because slowly I'm going to take some time to put on the, the commentaries of the video some links so you can see maybe videos of other masters or maybe you can see find books and so i will do it slowly so maybe when i do it i will tell it in my video to go back in all those videos to find the books yeah so thank you very much this was one hour and three minutes almost four bye bye <laughs>